And with that, I will stop talking um, and I will hand over to our keynote speaker, um, Professor Thomas Corvin, uh, who's based at the University of Luxembourg um, and head of the Public History Department at the Luxembourg Centre for Contemporary and Digital History. Um, he may be familiar to many of you in the room via his um, writings. Uh, he is an FNR Attract Fellow um, and leads the uh, Public History as a New Citizen Science of the Past project. Uh, Thomas has been the President of the International Federation for Public History from 2018 to 2021. And he received his PhD at the European University Institute uh, in Florence, that sounds lovely, uh, in 2012, and worked for several years in the United States at the University of Louisiana and at Colorado State University. He's the author of Public History, a Textbook of Practice. Spoiler alert, for those of you who are starting the MA, you'll be reading a chapter of that in uh, the next week or so. Um, and he's also written several articles and book chapters on public history. So I will hand over to Thomas. Please give him a warm welcome. Um, thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so honored to be there for the first grad conference, public history grad conference. Thank you to the students that I, I, I know from London, I mean, where we met uh, the last few days. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, uh, the University of York. It's, it's, a, it's a great campus. That's my first time in New York. I'm delighted to be there. It's a sunny day. Uh, I'm, and the program is fantastic, so I, I know I'm going to learn a lot today. Uh, Victoria asked me a, a difficult question, where? Where is public history now? So I don't know where it is, I know it is, it's already something. Um, and I thought about a couple of uh, answers to your question that I will present today. So, um, well first, where was public history before? It was everywhere and nowhere. We, we need to know where public history comes from, and there is this history of public history that I will slightly you know, discuss afterwards. But first, public historical practices were everywhere, right? Um, history was done in museums for decades, centuries. Uh, our history is nothing new, right? People have been practicing public history for, for decades, and people sometimes feel like, oh, that's public history? Well, I've been doing public history for, for years, so we are not here to tell people what they're doing because most of people outside of universities were doing public history. And we have to be very careful not to tell them what to do, uh, especially I'm an academic historian because I work in a university. I don't want to tell people in the museums, oh, that's what you should do, because they have been doing that way before I started to think about public history. So public historical practices were everywhere, but nowhere in the sense that there was no consensus about those practices. And uh, being in the UK, I cannot not mention the historical workshops, uh, the history workshops from the 70s, where, I mean, not where, but before we were even talking about public history. And to some extent, to many extent, that was public history. That was public historical practice, although I doubt they would have used public history in, in the 1970s. So you had this long history of public history that led to, it was not the first one, but it was one of the first ones to use public history as an expression. Bob Kelly, in the 1970s, decided, well, I'm training and teaching students, and some of them don't want to teach. They don't want to be educators. So they could work in uh, governments. They could work in, in archives. So we need to have a better training to teach our students to work in those institutions. When I did my uh, degree in history 15, 20 years ago, my professors told me, well, you could teach history, but you could work as a journalist. You could work in a museum. Well, <laughs> sorry, but I could not. They were teaching me how to do historical research. They were not teaching me how to work in a museum. So they were sort of a lie about uh, what can history students do. And I think Bob Kelly was aware of that. If we want our students to work in an archive, it's not enough to be a good uh, researcher. You need to be able to do archiving, for example, <laughs> preservation. So we need to change the way we uh, train our students to do history. So in the 1970s, in the US, you have this boom of public history program, or applied history program, that was also uh, part of the discussion in the 1970s. But the question is, uh, so is public history 
old wine in a new bottle, right? If we've been doing public historical practices for decades, what does that change to use public history? Uh, so first, we need to acknowledge that public historical practices have a long history. Right? Preservation is not new, uh, or history is not new. So we need to acknowledge that. We also need to acknowledge that uh, many people were doing public history without having the title of historian. And I think that's one benefit of doing public history. You don't have to be a professional historian to do public history. It's also, I think, um, a new field in university. We are training, we're teaching more and more public history. There's a danger in the sense that academic historians tend to control things, right? University professors think, well, this is public history. We control public history, we define public history, and I'm doing that too, right? Uh, I'm working in a university and I'm trying to define public history done by other people. So we have to be very careful not to impose definitions, but to work with different actors of public history to see how can we better engage with the public. And I think it's also creating a space, talking about public history, and we saw that yesterday, brings people from different horizons that may not have met without using the expression public history. Our kid is talking to university professor, talking to some student, to, to our guys about how do we engage with the public, right? Without any hierarchy about who is doing public history. So I think that's ben a benefit of public history. It's also a sort of network of security, right? If we have maybe a national association of public history, you have people uh, backing you up, right? Public history is a valid field not a discipline, a field of history making, and you can even present yourself, I'm doing public history, I'm applying for this job, see what my colleagues are doing. And I think public history can create this network of people who are doing the same job as you are. So, um, going back to yesterday, what is public history uh, now? Because where is public history relates to what is public history? I. This is a tree that you may see in the book, if you use the book, that I've designed a few years ago when my students asked me, oh, what's public history? And I said, well, I get some definitions, and uh, but it was not very, uh, uh, I kept changing my definition. So I came up with this metaphor of, of a tree, and that's not the only metaphor about public history. You have the umbrella, you have uh, archipelago, you have a different metaphor. But I like the public history, because uh, it broadens the, the process of doing history. And I'm going to go in some details about what I mean by a tree doing history. So you have the, the roots. For me, are the creation and preservation of sources. You do all history, you preserve a building, you preserve uh, emails, you um, preserve objects, you create sources. For me, that's part of public history. That's the roots. The trunk that you see there is the usual job of historians, using sources, interpreting sources, making sense to the past, right? That's what we usually do in history. But that's only one part of public history, because you have this, the branches, right? Usually when you do um, you know, some research, you uh, write an article, okay? But public history invites us to diversify the medium that we use to communicate to the public's plural. So public history is about the multiplication of media that you can use to engage with the public. So it could be uh, comics, have a PhD student who's doing a, a comic as a PhD research about the First World War. Could be exhibition, could be video games, could be obviously books and articles. But it's only one of the ways you can communicate with your public. And I think this is a major part of uh, public history, communicating and engaging for a different way with different publics. And if you use TikTok or Facebook, you're going to have a different public. So you have to consider how your medium, your communication, affects not only your work, but the people you're going to talk to. And choosing a, a way to communicate is not a detail that you do at the end of your project. You should think about your medium at the beginning. And last but not least, the, the, the leaves. The leaves are the multiple uses of history. I'm not saying that all uses are equal, it's not the point, <coughs> but that the uses impact also the research. To give you an example, COVID-19, right? More and more people have been thinking, oh, this is a historical moment. 
And you have seen some demands from people about, oh, we need to preserve the memories. What we've been doing the COVID, you know, uh, sitting all day, your back hurts, right? In a few years, that's going to become an archive, right, about the COVID-19 memories. So people asking you, asking the libraries, the museums, maybe, to collect memories about the COVID-19. So if we collect memories about the COVID-19, and many museums have been doing that, libraries, it's also an answer to the leads. People, hmm, maybe we should archive, maybe we should preserve our memories. So public history for me is a way of doing history that is broader than simply interpreting the past. It's important, but it's also communicating uh, the past to different publics. Public history is making history more public. Well, that's simple. What does that mean? It means to be more accessible to different publics. Right? Avoiding jargon when you talk, when you do a tour, for example. We had an example yesterday. It's engaging with the public. Right? The public is part of your work. It's not simply you delivering something. Yesterday, someone said it's not knowledge transfer, it's knowledge exchange. And I like this comparison. You're not delivering, you're not like a missionary giving knowledge. You're working with people. Working, oops, sorry. Working with is something very important, something difficult. Creating bridges between university, institutions, groups, associations, decider, people in the city hall who decide about tours in the city. Collaboration, creating bridges. And collaboration was again a big concept of, the, of yesterday in the last two days. And last, history with a public purpose. Right? What do you do with history? We can talk about activism, social justice, very important in Latin America. History for reconciliation, for example. So you have this aspect of public history. Not everybody accepts that, not everybody does social justice, but it's one of the components for some people in some countries. So in other words, you have um, to talk about where is public history. You have public histories. To do public history in Japan is different than doing public history in Brazil or doing public history in, in Scotland, right? So you have public histories. There's not one single definition because people would have, oh, I'm communicating or I'm working with or I'm applying history to public policy. So you have public histories and we have to be aware of that if we want to choose what we want to do. Because the public means different things for different people. Again, in Japan, if you try to translate public, wow, uh, you can't. Uh, same in, in French, if you translate public, it means different things. So we have to understand what public means to understand where public history is done. That means that there is no global public history. This was a book published um, three, four years ago. Table title. I know it's recorded, sorry, I know Paul. Um, <laughs> there is no global public history. I know the point was, well, there are global discussions, but there's no, not a global public history. Because again, it depends what you mean by public. Reconciliation, marketing, right? It's very different. You have no global public history, but you have public history programs all over the world. And um, with some, you may see some pattern already, but it's growing in Europe. It's growing also in Latin America. Brazil is perhaps the biggest network of public history in the world, uh, apart maybe far from the US. But you have public history in India, in South Africa, in Australia. And there are new programs in Kenya and so on. And I think one of the major companies is teaching, because public history is very important in teaching. And you have national associations, so the where. Uh, and I'm about to add <coughs> United Kingdom here. Um, so you have national associations of public history. You have the US, of course, but you have Brazil, Spain since last year, Italy, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Italy, and again, maybe uh, soon UK. What does that mean? I think it's also a way of thinking about networks, placements, students talking to each other, finding jobs. What kind of jobs do public history students find? We don't really know because we don't have the data. So I think we need to better learn about where public history is done to uh, inform our training. So you have an international development or rise of public history, which is also interesting. It's not one model. So we're not applying a North American model to the UK because to some extent we're doing public history before then. 
But that's not how it works. Everybody is trying to constitute its own definition of public key. And the International Federation, that's a website, we have a Facebook, social media, which is helpful for jobs, connecting people, knowing about projects. I encourage you to not say become a member, but follow us on social media. That uh, usually gives us some great ideas to connect. So, uh, to make the question even more difficult, where is public history going tomorrow? Again, I think in training. In training, uh, I said public uh, university training, but the training in university is always connected to outside the university. You learn public history in museums, you learn public history in media production, you learn public history in tour guide, a guided tour. So teaching is not only in the university. And I think that's something we, we all agree, that you learn public history in the classroom, okay, in the theory. Uh, theory, I'm thinking, I'm yes, you're here. <laughs> But also in the practices and placements are very important because you practice public history, you learn, sometimes you get a job from placement. Um, and why? Because you may know that it's not because you're a good researcher that you're a good teacher. I was trained as a good researcher. The first time I, I taught in a public school, middle school, it was terrible. It was so bad. I was not a good teacher at all. I had to learn how to become a teacher. So moving from historical research to teaching is quite different. And I know you know that if you've been teaching. The same for public history. You can be a good researcher, you go to the archives, or a terrific essay, yes. And then you're communicating in a podcast. You're too fast, right? You're using jargon. You need to learn how to communicate your work. And teaching helps us, myself included, because I'm, le I'm learning from my students, how to communicate history, how to work with people, building trust. I've never been taught in school how to build trust with partners, but if you don't build that trust, collaboration will be extremely difficult. So we need to learn new skills. And we, there is no survey in Europe, yes, but there was one in, in the US a few years ago about what skills employers want from public history students. It may be small, but here you have for entry level, and they say, well, Written and, written and oral communication, yes. Historical research, yes. Historiography, yes. But then also public speaking, project management, archiving, and so on. So it means that we have maybe some additional skills to learn in public history. And this question, in the future, what do you think will be the most important skills? Fundraising. <laughs> um, it is a bit depressing. But it's so true too, especially if it was done before COVID. If you ask now, uh, fundraising will be even more important. So that's why we have workshops about grant application. How do you apply for a grant? It's not only for uh, public history. Any postdoc should be able to write a grant because that's how we get money now and money is project collaboration. So you have a few skills that we're trying to add to the curriculum. The danger is that we have so many skills that it's overwhelming for students. We're asking them to become good researchers and then good public speaker, and then it's, it's exhausting. So we need to choose where we want to be. So where is public history informs how we teach public history. This is last week from London, Canada, not London, UK. Uh, introduction to public history. So it was a classroom discussion. That's the whiteboard that they use. I don't know if you can uh, read, but they say, well, different public, communicating, uh, non-tribal, academic versus uh, public history. And I highlighted what I think are the three most important keywords, collaboration, working with, accessible, shared authority. How do you work with people when you're not only delivering knowledge, but you're exchanging knowledge? And I added, because I... I wanted to make things even more complex. Polyvocality. When you work with different people, they have different interpretations of the same event. How do you deal with that? Right? When you have an, an exhibition and uh, you have different under understanding of World War II or the Battle of the Boy, you know? how do you make an exhibition with multiple voices? And where is history? Because sometimes we do so public things that we forget about history. Sometimes my students forget about archives critical, being critical of the archive. So we should not lose sight of history in public history either. 
Um, and uh, about the where, these are a few questions that I got, uh, uh, I heard from conferences, from people who sometimes are very critical about public history. And the most critical people are usually my colleagues, historians. Anthropologists, fine. Media experts, fine. Sociologists, yeah. Uh, political scientists, yes. Heritage, yes. Who criticize you? Historians. Because they say, well, you can't share authority with the public, right? It, it's not possible. So, a couple of concepts that people have been discussing in public history, and I think very important authority, right? Who has authority? Not only who owns the past, that's a different question, but who has the authority to tell history? Expertise. What is expertise in history? When you interview someone who went through an event, a witness, who has expertise? You, her, him? That's something very important in discussing the theory of public history. And memories. I keep going to uh, conferences where some people think that memories and public history are the same thing. I always disagree. <laughs> I think memories are important, and we need to understand how groups create memories or remember things. But memory studies and public history are not the same thing. And memory studies have been done and doing great things. For me, public history is not exactly the same. In public history, you have, in memory studies, you study groups as, as sources, usually, right? Uh, you study memories. In public history, there's also this action dimension, right? This making history accessible. So both are connected, but not the same thing. How long do you guys have? Oh, you can go for another 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you. But we can also have time for questions, whichever you prefer. Questions, so... Well, we have until 11. Okay, so yeah, 10, 10 minutes or something? Okay. Uh, so a couple of concepts or reflections. Working with publics. Uh, last week, my uh, proofreader told me, ah, you can't use an S in public, it's public, not publics. So change your title. No. I want to use publics because I want to emphasize on the fact that you have different publics, there's no such thing as one public. It makes you think about what people want and how you react to different voices, different interpretations. So how do you share authority with uh, different publics? This is uh, a seminal book, uh, A Shared Authority, Michael Frisch, 1990, which has the, the merit of putting a word under this collaboration. You know, when you work with, uh, in our history, you have this shared authority, he says, because you have the witness who knows something, remembers something, and you are the historian who tries to make sense or contextualize to what the witness is saying. So a shared authority is coming from that. Okay, fair enough. How do you do that in an exhibition? That's way more difficult. So the, the key idea is that sharing is not a given. Sharing is always a process. It's discussed. You're not sharing your authority with the, the museum or the group. You're not the one sharing, right? Sometimes they're, they're more sharing with you than you're sharing with them. So it's a construction, it's a discussion, sometimes it's refused. Some people don't want to work with you. Or sometimes you don't want to work with people. And that was a, a very important discussion with my students in the US about monuments. Do you discuss with white supremacists? And there's no one single answer, but the question is, Sometimes you don't want, and they don't want to work with you, and that's fine. And why do you share? There are many, many answers to that. Uh, a line coming from Bangalore in India that I find very uh, powerful. We belong to that very India which finds no place in the textbooks of history. You share because some voices have been underrepresented by dominant narrative. You share because some groups on, or some parts of history have been silenced, and that's actually the, the title of this brilliant book, Silencing the Past, which explains or trying to explore how archiving is silencing, right? Because you have power and powerful structure in archiving. Who decides what to archive, right? Before the archive, during the archives. I think public history is this also self-reflection about how do we know what we know? Who is not in the narrative? And maybe working with people who don't have written sources, like in the indigenous communities in the US, who have a more oral history tradition, right? So no written archives. 
if you think about what you have in the archives and what you don't have, maybe it impacts whom you're working with. And sharing is not losing, right? Uh, that's a criticism from some historians. I can't share something with someone who doesn't have an expertise. Well, it's not like I share, I lose, right? It's more complex than that, right? It's an exchange. You're not losing, you're doing a history degree doesn't mean that you know, you're losing your authority when you work with a, a community, right? You're exchanging expertise. And I prefer that exchange than this uh, hierarchy of authority. And again, we're not the first ones to discover this, these different levels of participation. It's just that historians are late. <laughs> you have this uh, uh, ladder of participation, 1969, about public policy, Einstein that says that you have different levels of participation. It's not all participatory or not. You have different levels. 1969, from manipulation to season control, like 60 or 50 years ago. On in assignment, 2010, the Participatory Museum, uh, a, a great book, and she says that you have different levels of participation in museums, and not everything has to be fully participatory. Right? So, Again, we need to think about who, whom we're working for and what has to be participatory. Sometimes not everything has to be participatory. Right? Sometimes it doesn't work. Also, a shared authority is about, again, not losing authority. I think it's more about combining expertise. It may be optimistic, but that's how I try to see things. So we always share authority anyway. When we work, uh, let's say, you are an historian, working in a historical association, and you want to help making an exhibition in the museum. You're going to have to share authority anyway with the curator, with the marketing officer, with the educator. So we're doing that anyway. The question is, can we extend that sharing with other people? I think the answer is yes, but you need to understand why you're sharing authority. Sometimes they have a living expertise, witness, right? So we do that in our history. They have been through things. They can help you to understand what happened. They have living tradition. This is an example of a Chicago museum where you have a representative of the uh, native community in Chicago helping to understand the history of that uh, artifact. So you have the curator, and you have that representative of the community who is helping to understand how you should um, design the exhibition according to the tradition of that object. Some committees are very um, adamant in uh, designing space for the sacred objects, right? Some objects have to be in a, way, in a certain way and not in the other. So this is part of this combined expertise that you can do in museums. So that's a very good theory, but does that work? Because uh, again, that's very optimistic. Does it work? What doesn't work? What's more difficult? I want you to finish with one example from Luxembourg. Tiny country between Belgium, Germany, France, uh, where we, we started with a wall. We have a wall and a building, and the idea is, can we show the history of the neighborhood on that wall? Hmm. Can we work with artists? And that's something, again, we, we uh, learn uh, yesterday about artists working with historians to represent the past. Can we show with an artist emotions about the history of that building? So that was the main idea at the beginning. So we started to work with the local residents to represent the history of their neighborhood on the wall. Again, nothing revolutionary, but we wanted that to be as participatory as possible. So we had different steps to make the, the project more collaborator, collaborator. We use social media to collect objects, photographs about, about the neighborhood. We organize this uh, citizen historian circles in, we, in which we meet and we ask people with a living expertise to help us understanding the neighborhood. We had a tour, we had a harvest, and we have a public vote. I'm gonna explain what that means. So social media collecting, we use Facebook, we create a Facebook group, again, nothing new but to collect objects, family pictures about the neighborhood. This is one of the pictures that we got, and people were very keen in sharing pictures, family pictures. That's what works best on Facebook. And comments about, oh, I know, this was here. 
uh, you know, the, the old uh, part of the neighborhood was under the construction. So social media collecting. The chic, the citizen historian circle. We went to a cafe well, uh, with a few beers, but you know, that's part of the reward. And the idea was, uh, let's try to think about the different keywords that could be the history of the neighborhood. So people were talking about industry, bikes, uh, the brewery that was in the, in the neighborhood. So keywords, asking people what, in one word, how they could define their neighborhood. So we come up with a few categories that we have used later. Then we brought the artist, and we had this memorial tour in which she encounters people. We were ringing bells and say, you know, can you tell us your, your uh, memories of the neighborhood? That's the artist. And we did the memorial tour. And uh, who are under the spotlight? Not us, but the local residents, explaining their memories of the neighborhood. And the artist is absorbing everything from this tour. Right? So you have the social media collect, some archives. You have the keywords. You have the memories. You have the history harvest, people coming with an object about the neighborhood, talking to each other, talking to the artist, trying to make sense and to create some historical understanding. So what, that's one more step, right? And one thing that came up was the, the move in 40 years from this rural uh, part of the city to a concrete part, like uh, buildings and the, the dramatic change in a few decades which is again nothing new but something very important in the emotion about the change of the neighborhood. And we went from places to places with this cool wagon, uh, asking people to come and, and share their stories, uh, grandchildren bringing their grandparents in this cozy place to talk about the past. So that was the, the fun part. And then the artist came up with uh, six drawings to represent the, the neighborhood. Six possible drawings, that I mean, you see three, that people could vote for. So I was on Friday knocking at doors uh, for people to vote on the six drawings. And you had this red box in which they could also vote. It was close to a school, so people were stopping. Oh, I like that one because of this. And we had about 350 votes. And my vote didn't win. <laughs> and I was fine. They said, oh, at least it works. My, my voice is not more important than the others. This is uh, the sketch that won, and this is the artist designing the, the, the painting on the wall. You may not notice it, but I will tell you what is the impact of participation. This is what people wanted in this fresco. The first airport in Luxembourg was in this neighborhood with a direct line between London and Esch. Uh, and nobody, I mean, very few people remember that, but the locals went, Yes, this is specific about the neighborhood. I, we want that. So you can find that here. This is the family picture that we got on Facebook. Right? And the artist, and it was this artistic production, she wanted to have this as part of this 1950s uh, young generation after war. This was part of this uh, specific aspect of the history of the neighborhood. And this, uh, the opposition between black, black and white, the past, which was rural, uh, people were ice skating in the wood, and the new neighborhood, the 1960s, the modern city, with concrete schools, everything, uh, they cut up the trees, so you had this opposition, black and white, rural past, and colorful present. So this came from the chic, the citizen meeting in the bar, uh, at the beginning of the, the project. So, from that, uh, not, not everything worked, but what we can see is that not all expertise are on the same level in public history, right? And some people, we're talking about that, some people, when you do uh, you know, public collaboration, some people are angry, racist. You know, not, not everything is equal, right? We're not saying that participation brings equality and relativism. Not everything is true, for example. You have not all the same expertise. Not all the interpretations are equally valid. But you're creating a framework inclusive framework in which you can hear different voices about the past. And I think what is important in public history is that you don't share a final product. You share, I think, a methodology. You share a framework in which, and, and tools for people to participate in, in history. And I think that's one, um, well, beautiful aspect of public history. 
So finally, uh, maybe for the next conference, uh, if you do that, what's the role of trained historians? You know, why do you get a degree in history, right? So that, that goes back to the expertise. We need historians for this and that, right? We need historians because of contextualization, because of critical sources. So you, we still need to learn and to have degrees in history. But the question is also how to work with different partners and whom you don't want to work with. I think that's a question we don't ask ourselves enough. Whom are we not interviewing in our history? Whom are we not working with because of this and that? I think that should be transparent in the public history project. And uh, I think that the last thing is uh, we, we need more training to be able to be part of the public space. And we hear so many opinions on social media, and that's fine. So many opinions about the past. We hear very little and you know, few stories because sometimes we don't have the, the tools to be in the public space. So if we get the tools, I'm not saying that uh, you know, racist comments and racist opinions will disappear, no. But voices from these two ones and institutions may be more heard because we know how to communicate, we know how to work with different partners to be more powerful. So I think that's the optimistic word for the, the conclusion. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you have many questions. working now? Yeah. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, I have a second microphone, um, so I am able to bring it to anyone who has a question or something that they would just like to share um, in response to what Thomas has said. Would anyone like to start us off? So, I'm on my way. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, this is a very important question. Um, that project was easy in the sense that I, I got the funding for five years. Uh, the problem, and I think that would I'll try to answer your question, is that it's not a participatory funding. And I think that's one drawback, I don't know about the UK, but drawback in Luxembourg, in, in, in France, and Italy. You have more or less to be an academic to ask for funding. Um, and they are very, the funders are very reluctant to have co-participatory uh, funding application. What I want to develop is for the committees to get the money as well, because most of them are, are volunteering, and that's, that's uh, a lot to ask them, and what do they get, right? I, I'm paid for what I do, they're not paid for what they do, and my university doesn't want to pay them. Uh, we can't even pay guests, uh, which is... Um, so we need to change the funding applications, and I think we are lucky to have a funding agency who's, who's listening to us, and if they want to do participation, it's not only in the final project, that should be in the grant application. So writing grants with partners, and I think you do it better in the UK than we do um, in, in Luxembourg, and that's the model I would like to, to discuss more, to have people from the beginning, communities, associations, working with us so that they tell us also what they need, what they want, and a way to get, to get money. Because you know, the only thing is, oh, we can invite them to, to, the, to the event. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so, um, and museums have the same problems. Sometimes they can't pay uh, their, uh, their participants, so they invite them to a trip, but again, that's, that's a biased uh, way of, of using money. So I, I don't have the solution, but I know that's a problem that we should work on having this participatory grant application. And also to help them to apply for grants, right? To, to, because those are skills to apply for grants. You have jargon that you need to use, you have uh, you know, tricks, 
And if we can help communities to apply also for themselves, that would be that would be great. Uh, but to be for them to get money would be uh, that's that's a, a very important point. Thank you. Yes, over here. Ooh, traffic jam. Um, yeah, it was really interesting to hear about that project. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, I'm talking about money as well, I'm afraid. But um, do you think that model that you were talking about, where it's a community project from the start, is more common in arts funding? And that's something that probably the historians don't look at enough. So, for instance, in this country, the Arts Council, the artists could apply, and that's something that people don't look at enough. Yeah, maybe that uh, I would think so. Uh, I'm I'm not sure because I'm not familiar with the art application. I would assume so, and I think that's a good idea to um, to to be uh, I mean to, to learn more from art application in in public funding because you you have this community participation even more than in public issues. So I, I would tend to think so. Um, how it works, I don't know. But I'm I'm very open to uh, get your suggestions about about that. That should be a model we we could develop in public. Again, these ones are late. Uh, we tr we think that we were developing public history, but people have been doing that in in our square before. So we should be inspired by those models if there are any models. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd make your job easier for you. Yeah. You could just have passed it between you. Yeah. I was like, Actually, I yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Thomas. That was a really interesting overview, and I really liked how you moved through time there. I'm really intrigued um, about the point you made regarding more training needed for historians and how to be historians in public spaces, because I think that's also something that came out of the conference in London as well. I wondered if you had any more specific ideas about what those areas might be, and maybe the ways in which we could go about making that training happen. Yes. Big uh, question, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that's a very important question. And actually, uh, the point we got from London is that we should hear and work more with, with students. Because we had this um, student takeover, and they were telling us uh, what works and what could work better. And I, I think this is something we should all do, like uh, exiting students telling us, you know, once they got their mark, final exams, and they're telling us, oh, actually, you should do more on that. Um, I think it depends where you want to be. Uh, public history is so wide, so broad, that you could do everything. I think it's very important to have core uh, teaching, for example, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the theory or, uh, or history, but you also have uh, options that you should develop. For example, if you want to work more in museums, or if you want to work more in heritage management or in podcasting, then you would require different skills. What I, I like in introduction to public history is communicating. So I'm asking my team to do a, a short research and then to communicate that research through a, a podcast, for example. And writing script is the skill that I want them to learn in addition to public speaking. How to breathe, for example, which sounds uh, super easy, if not, right? So working with my colleagues from the performance center and theater about, oh, how do you speak in front of a mic? Uh, where did you breathe? How fast did you go? So those are soft skills, but super important if you want to work in communication. And it's not only, oh, public history is just communication. No, it's how you deliver your work, right? Uh, you, if, you, if you don't know how to write, uh, your dissertation might be uh, difficult. If you can't speak, that's going to be the same in podcasting. So it depends where you want to be. If you want to work in archiving, you don't need you know, maybe public speaking. But you need to know what kind of public history you want to do and then adapt uh, the, the courses and the skills that you, um, you want to take. But communicating and working with are, I think, for me, the, the two pillars that we should, uh, we should try to develop. Yes. Hopefully we do some of that. <laughs> Uh, hi Thomas, that was a really nice uh, presentation. Um, I was thinking um, in, in the past two weeks, you know, the UK went through quite a big historical change in that we I had heard, yes. a new prime minister <laughs> and then a new, new monarch. And watching the responses 
Um, you've got a lot of social media responses, a lot of you know platforms like the BBC saying share your tributes, and there were so many pictures coming in, and it did make me uh, wonder, you know, as you were saying here, having more trained history students in the public space with social media, it is possibly um, difficult maybe for historians to grasp social media. Do you think that? students in that sense are like the bridge between um, common social media platforms and history as an academia um, in helping, uh, you know, academics, you know, communicate with people on emerging social media trends? In so many ways, yes. I mean, the ball is in your court. Uh, I mean, students are those who are going to pave the way of what public history will be. Because um, you know we 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 are launching a sort of concept which is not you based on practice, but we are launching a kind of idea, and then the job is then yours to to make public history. So in a sense, yes, uh, it's up to you to find ways to engage with the public, but also depends. Do you want to understand how public history is discussed in the public sphere? So that's something I do for my undergrads, understanding oh what are the public discussion about monuments. So you try to understand the, the opinions, the, the, the arguments, or do you want to be involved and, and make public history on social media? That's a different uh, process. And I, I do think so. Um, I do think that I'm involved in public history on social media, and you have specific ethics to follow, specific skills to, to do, uh, depending on social media. Uh, I'm, I'm using social media campaign as an assignment for my students. But again, it depends what you want to do. Uh, if it's about tweeting about the history of the monarchy, yes. Or if it's about rapid response collecting, right? Collecting tweets. Or Muslims have been doing that for uh, Trump or for 9-11 uh, before. Rapid response collecting, collecting uh, images, objects that people share about an event. Terrorist attacks, you have uh, digital archiving. It's a very specific skill and you have also traumatic uh, emotions in that. So it's a specific skill, something you can do. Again, depends where you want to be in public history. So my answer would be yes, and different options for you to do so. Hi, thank you for the overview and everything. Um, I think my question is more like picking on the vocab. So the time that I'm thinking about public history, reading about public history, that what always comes up with me is, so where do you draw the line, or do you draw a line between the public and the historian? When does the public become a historian? Would you say that an, an undergrad student is a historian, or an A-level student is a historian? So where is the line? Is there a line, maybe? Um, I, it's a good question. I try not to use the word public historian. I try not to use the word historian, um, especially when I work with partners. Because when I say, oh, I'm an historian, they either look at me like I'm the expert, or they shut up because they're afraid of what I'm going to say. So I'm, what I'm saying is I'm a public history practitioner. And I have friends who are YouTubers, and I consider them as public history practitioners. So I don't draw the line. I use the tree. Say, well, you help me communicate. I'm doing the research. I'm only one actor of the process. And I try to. Uh, I don't know if that word exists in, in English, disarm. It's, it's, it's a French name, like you, uh, um, well, the conflict, the, the tension. And I, I don't draw the line, and I'm not drawing a line between public history and academic history, because it's very difficult to define what is what. And I'm thinking in terms of public uh, levels of public history. It's more or less public, it's more or less accessible, it's more or less participatory. It's more or less history, and we can talk about that too. I mean, not everything is history. You have Facebook groups are all about sharing nostalgic pictures. Oh, it was way before, it was better before, right? Uh, how do you deal with that? So you have levels, and I prefer levels to lines. So I, I, I never say I'm a public historian, I'm an historian, and they are communicators. And public history practitioners for me is more useful. Uh, 
love what you talked about is obviously about sharing authority and just knowledge exchange. Sometimes it can be very difficult when you're working with lots of different partners with lots of different voices um, to A, to distill that into a, a product like an exhibition, but also to make all of those people feel heard um, and work with different groups, particularly if, sort of, as you mentioned, you may not necessarily agree with some of their values, for example. Is there any element of uh, public history training courses and master's programmes or anything like that where you help students to safeguard their own mental health and their own um, safety in some ways um, whilst doing public history projects? Yeah, there are two questions here about <laughs> different voices. No, 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 different voices and, and uh, your mental health. And coming from the US where mental health is a thing. I mean, we, we talk about it. We do things about mental health, and it's part of the graduate programs, right? Um, because this is how they, they, they work. They have many flows, but you know, mental health is, is something we discuss. And I think it's um, maybe even more difficult in public history uh, because it's so much connected to the present. You're working with living people and not archives only, right? And can be first traumatic, and there are plenty of discussion about archives and trauma. Uh, when do you not archive, for example, uh, these kind of things that are part of the theory, but also connected to your ethical practice. But also um, detaching yourself from your, from your project, which is so difficult. When you're so, since I'm sometimes so passionate about that project, you know, it's weekdays, weekend, um, the, the partners become friends, right? And you work for, I mean, social justice is so powerful. You talk to people in Bogota about peace and reconciliation, people who lost. I think it's sometimes also important to detach yourself from, I have no perfect solution, but I think this is something of the ethics that we should be teaching and also learning from students in the class, talking about ethics, talking about how do you protect yourself on social media, for example, when you have bad people uh, talking to you and referring to you and uh, so you have this ethics of protection which is not only on social media we should include more about ethics of protecting yourself and, and discussion about about the, the effect of, of history effect of history and emotions it's not only in your dissertation it's also in, in your life and and i don't think we talk uh, enough about it so i don't know maybe one solution would be to include that not as a you know, course policy in your syllabus, but having sessions about about ethics and talking about the impact of history on your life. I'm afraid we're going to have to draw this keynote session to a close, um, so that we can give you a little break before we move into panels. And um, can I just ask you all uh, to join me in thanking Thomas again for this keynote?